Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio, where I am once again uh, starting on the new structure build. Uh, this one for my spooky themed gruesome gulch project that's been ongoing. And this one is uh, arguably the most important uh, building or business in town uh, for a ghost town, and it's the, uh, the Undertaker Shop. M.T. Graves Undertaker. Get it? Empty, empty graves. <laughs> so over here on my work table, I have got a a passel of laser cut parts hot off of the uh, Flux Beambox Pro. Um, this time I'm doing something a little different. This is some sixteenth uh, of an inch thick basswood, one of my favorite materials to work with and to use on the laser. And uh, this time I've gone ahead and etched the graphics right into the front wall. So um, I've done this uh, a couple of times before and uh, I like the way it turned out. So we're going to use that technique on the Undertaker shop. So the walls, the main walls are uh, 16, 16th of an inch thick. Uh, and then all of the detail parts. This is some 25 thou laser board, which I really like to use. Laser board is like a, a thin MDF uh, type product. Got a little plastic impregnated in there, something to make it a little stiffer. Great for use on the laser. And the 25 thou thickness is, is a, a real workhorse for uh, model railroading use kits and models and things like that. <clears throat> in O scale, it's, it's really darn close to uh, an inch thick. So it's uh, very, very handy. So I've got all the doors and the windows and the trim, and some detail parts and things like that. And we've got a floor. I haven't cut a roof yet. And that, whoops, and that's already coming out of there. This is a back for the back of the false front right there, because that's going to be visible from behind. Now I want to get some stain on these pieces, kind of a silvery gray stain. Uh, but before I do that, I want to add some age and distress to these boards, because this is a, supposed to be a, a dilapidated old building. So, you know, I'll use my razor saw, add some grain, probably add some nail holes, some splits with the hobby knife, all of that good stuff, just to give these uh, individual boards that I've etched in here some character. Notice I'm not just going <laughs> across the whole piece of wood. I'm picking out each individual board for detailing. And that way it has its own grain pattern. A lot of times I'll take and uh, as I do this, I'll, I'll uh, twist the blade kind of in a curvy manner like this to get a little bit more interesting grain than just parallel lines. Now I'm going to use a, a nail in my pin vise to add some nail holes where these uh, boards meet up, these that are scribed in here. And don't, when you're adding nail holes, don't forget down at the tops and the bottom too, because there's always framing down there. Now I'll use my hobby knife, add some knot holes, kind of random places. I'm just sticking it in and giving it a little twirl. Now I'm just taking the hobby knife and adding some splits to the wood, and running it down the length of the boards. And the last thing is I'm going to take a wire brush, just go over everything. What that'll do is those um, those little scribe lines, those cuts I just made with the hobby knife, this is going to widen them a little bit, make them rougher, which is what I want, so they don't look so uniform. Now I'm ready to get some stain on these parts, and this uh, stain is 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol and uh, black shoe dye. 
And I've demonstrated this before, but basically what you do is you take all of the black shoe dye out of a bottle and you pour it out into another container. And then you fill this bottle the rest of the way up, all the way up to the top with uh, rubbing alcohol. Shake it up and you've got a nice silvery wood stain. And I'm staining both sides because I would prefer it if these pieces didn't warp. And you see how the stain soaks back into all that detail I just added. I'm going to put a little weight on these pieces while they, while they dry. So they'll dry flat. But I also still want to um, allow some airflow in there. And while I wait for those to dry, I can start assembling the uh, windows and doors and trim pieces. These are all uh, layered assemblies. Just build them up and gluing one layer on top of the other. This is the main uh, trim piece. Kind of a uh, carpenter gothic version of a column, a classical column something you see a lot these old Victorian era buildings just using some yellow carpenter's glue applied with a small brush now this bit of fanciness goes right over the top of this this goes on this <laughs> isn't that the way every build goes this goes on this and this goes on that Gives it a nice little fancy detail. Now, if you haven't already figured it out, um, this is designed to be reminiscent of a tombstone. Yeah. We've got a date plaque. Goes up on the top. It's engraved with the year 1872, which seems like a likely choice. A building like this. Now I've got these delicate little moldings around the top of the arch. Those are about scale inch and a half thick, inch and a half wide, I should say. And there's a frame for this number plate. There it is. I don't know what it, that's called. I keep calling it a number plate. On the you know that's up at the top of buildings. You often see it in. Victorian era false front buildings. Perhaps an architecture student out there can correct me, give me the proper terminology. Number plate, you know, that's something you find on a locomotive. <laughs> I'm not sure what that's what they call it when it's on a building. A date, a date plate, builder's date. I'm sure there's got to be a fancy name for it. Now I've got these um, little faces that are carved into the wood. It's kind of a Roly Crump inspired design here. Little one-eyed Cyclops dude. One at the top of each of these pillars. Looking inward towards the building. I was reading a book on Roly Crump while I uh, was designing this. Now, oh, by the way, if you don't know who Rolly Crump is, Rolly Crump, of course, is uh, one of the designers of the Haunted Mansion. Um, one of the most imaginative and creative and original of the Disney Imagineers and just an all around swell guy. He uh, <laughs> somehow was able to be a Disney Imagineer and kind of a hippie beatnik artist at the same time, which is a was no mean feat back in the 60s. Walt let him be who he was, which is, I think, a testament to Walt also. Okay, so there is the completed front wall trim. It's also got a couple little spooky faces down here at the bottom, a little more traditional kind of triangular pumpkin eyes. And that's going to go right on there like that. <laughs> I like it. Now I can put the doors together. Same kind of layered construction. 
in addition to this looking like a tombstone, I also wanted it to look, the whole front to look kind of like a scary face. So you've got the, these two windows for the eyes and this kind of a moaning mouth down here at the bottom. And I even built some fangs into the design of the doors. Make sure that all fits the way it's supposed to. And door frame. And get a little arch up on top. Very fine piece of molding. See if I can get it on there without dropping it on the floor and losing it. Oof, that's about a scale inch thick. Ooh, that's tiny. This is why I don't do end scale. If I was doing end scale, all you all you hear me saying all the time would be, ooh, that's tiny. <laughs> That's really small. <laughs> I can't handle it, man. Hats off to those of you who can. Boom. All right, we're moving right along. All right, now I'm putting the windows together. They're made of one, two, three, four, five, six pieces. Double hung windows. It's rather fancy casements. I like this. Uh, gothic top on here. It's got a little bit of, uh, I don't know if you can see that, a little engraving in there, a little floral detail. And as I'm doing this, I'm trying to decide what color I'm going to paint all of the trim. I haven't decided yet. I haven't, I haven't quite figured it out. I really like the way this looks in brown. I might go with a with a dark brown. I really like the way the wall looks just stained like that. I think I'm just going to go with the stain look and then do a complementary color, a darker color on the trim. It's either going to be a, a brown, a dark red, or a dark, dark green. I haven't quite decided yet. Soon, though. straight so it sits in the window opening properly all right just one more window to build and the rest are just flat trim pieces no need to build them up well it's a, a new day here at the studio and i've let everything just kind of sit overnight and now i'm ready to start painting all of the trim pieces that i built yesterday the windows the doors etc but uh, I still haven't been able to decide on a color. So um, I'm going to do a little test here. I've uh, created a couple of sample pieces of trim and painted them with the two finalists, the two final colors I'm thinking about using. And this is something you can do too if you're, you know, if you're not quite sure what direction to go with with a model. Um, what colors you want, you know, take, uh, paint some test strips and lay them on there and see how you like it. I've got two different colors, as I said. One is, uh, this is a, just a good old uh, red oxide, which, you know, it's really hard to go wrong with red oxide on these models. Yeah, you know, that could work. Um, and the second one is this sort of um, faded out dusty dark green which looks pretty good on there too this green is actually the um, rust-oleum uh, camo dark green ultra flat really like that color i love this color for painting uh, uh, foliage on the layout things like that but i think i'm liking it a lot here for this trim also yeah it's a little more subtle than the uh, the oxide red. I could, I mean, I could gray this down, but I'm really liking the way that looks. Okay, I think I've reached a decision. Thank you for uh, helping me out there, bearing with me while I figured that out. We're gonna go with the uh, with the musty olive green. So now I can uh, lay all of these pieces out, and uh, we'll get some paint on them. This 
is a paint and primer in one, so it's a real time saver. Don't have to worry about priming these pieces first. I know I said I was uh, just going to leave these walls as they are, uh, just uh, stained, but um, you know me, I can't leave things alone. Um, <laughs> so I decided I'm going to I'm going to dry brush on just a little bit of color, um, a very complementary color, which is this uh, uh, acrylic uh, titanium, unbleached titanium, which is like an antique white or a very light tan. <clears throat> and I'm going to dry brush it on very lightly just to give the look of it was painted once, but the paint is all faded away or since uh, you know flaked off. Start at the top end, just kind of very lightly going against the grain. Almost no paint on the brush. It's a very subtle effect, but it is there. You can already see it's lighter at the top than it is down towards the bottom, which is something I want. I want it to look like the paint has become desaturated and flaked away down towards the bottom of the building. Also notice I'm starting on the back, <laughs> which is the least visible part uh, of the structure where it's going to be on the layout. But that's working nicely. Just need to build it up in very thin dry brushed layers. Almost none down here on the bottom. And there you can see the look I'm after. It's subtle, but it's there. And since these graphics are etched in, they're actually laser etched into the surface, um, I can dry brush it right over the top without worrying about coloring the letters because I'm just hitting the high spots. So those recessed engraved letters stay darker. Now I want to use the same color and uh, dry brush it onto all of the windows and doors too before I install those. This helps to uh, bring out the three dimensional details and it also grays everything out, desaturates it, makes it look old and worn, which is what we're after. So I was getting ready to, uh, to do the glazing on the windows and then I changed my mind on the trim color for the doors. I decided to go with the oxide red on just on the doors. Because you'll see when they're in there like this, that makes it really nice. That looks really nice and it uh, actually makes it look more like a mouth. <laughs> Which is kind of what I had in mind. I'm going to go with that. So now I'm going to glaze the windows. I got some. Uh, acetate here and cut that to size and the question becomes how many broken windows do I want you know I don't want them all to be broken I want some of them to be broken and cracked Just putting some breaks in this with my uh, hobby knife I'll remove this part right here. So this is kind of a trial and error thing. You just keep doing it until it looks right to you. Some canopy glue. Not bad. Let's do the rest of them. Okay, I've got the glazing in all of my windows. You can see the broken panes of glass in there. And now I'm going to turn all these over and spray the backs with um, the back of the glazing with some uh, uh, clear acrylic matte finish just to fog the glass a little bit, make it look kind of dirty. Um, 
I wanted more fogging on the doors, so I did those with, um, that's just some um, Scotch Magic Tape stuck to the back of the glazing on those. I went ahead and cut some uh, tiny little latch plates for the doors also. I'm just going to paint these with some Vallejo brass and glue them into place. Now I think I can uh, start putting these pieces together. I'm going to assemble the doors and windows into the front wall uh, while it's still in the flat before I put the walls together. those uh, the window casements in um, I'll go in from the back and pit in the uh, the lower sash <laughs> also want to go ahead and finish these uh, side walls while we're still in the flat uh, this side has a window, which I've already put in, and this side has a um, has a faux freight door, and I've just uh, laser etched the side of the wall to look like uh, uh, there's uh, freight doors there. I'm gonna put the frame on it and some Z braces to uh, finish it off. <laughs> Here's some little pieces of business on the back of this that I want to show you. I added some uh, bracing. This is some uh, O scale 6x6 or just 1 8 by 1 8 stock. Uh, this is a laser cut piece right here which will uh, hold the rafters, the other end of the rafters as they come down to slope the roof to the, uh, to the back wall. And I just finished gluing in this uh, piece up here which adds uh, six inch board detail uh, to the back of the false front and there's one more thing I want to add before I start putting all this uh, together and that is some curtains I've already done some on the side window you can see they're all kind of old and shredded there to match the broken glass and uh, now I'm going to do some on these uh, front windows this is a technique you may have seen me use before. This is crepe paper. And I'm just going to cut this in half with the grain of the crepe. See, it's going that way. And then you fold this over like so. Now I'm going to use a little bit of yellow glue. I am going to use the drapes to uh, enhance the illusion of uh, the windows being eyes. This one's going to go like so, halfway across. If I really wanted to be wacky, I could make them cross-eyed, but I think that might be a little much. I 
use my hobby knife down here to just make this really ragged on the end. All right, now we can start putting these walls together, I do believe. I've been adding some more uh, six by six interior bracing. But before I add the last two walls, I want to uh, paint the interior flat black, just like I did with the, uh, the newspaper office. That way, when you look through the windows, all you'll see is just kind of empty void. One uh, last thing I wanted to show you before I glue the back wall in and seal this all up. Um, this partition. I put this uh, little partition in here. It's just made out of some foam core. And the idea is that if there's a light bulb down in here, it will block the view from the windows. You won't be able to see the bulb, but the light will still be able to make it up into here. So that's all that's for. Just a little behind the scenes trickery. Now, put that back wall in. that stuff dry. I think I can start in on the trim. Now I could have done all this trim with some scale lumber but you know I was designing stuff for the laser and I already had the dimensions and I was right there so I thought what the heck I'll just go ahead and cut it while I'm cutting everything else. Save a little time on this gruesome gulch project. It should all fit together beautifully. Now I can put these uh, two by six rafters in. Cut a piece of uh, chipboard. This is some um, about one thirty-second of an inch thick uh, chipboard, and uh, I'm going to use rolled roofing. Probably use some uh, black construction paper for that. But uh, just like I did on the newspaper office, I want to I want to have a hole in the roof, uh, at least one. So I've drawn in some slats here, and then I'm just going to go in and cut out. Uh, the uh, the open spaces so when the rolled roofing is put on it'll look like there's a big hole in the roof. Now could I laser cut this? Yes absolutely I could but this in this case for something like this just you know freehanding it is actually faster than uh, you know having to go in and design it you know, in a, in a graphics program and then importing it to the laser, all that. Yeah, this is actually just a, a faster way to do it. You see, when I put this on here, 
You see how the rafters show through like that. It's a great look. I can just take my same stain. Let's go over those real quick like that. Just for the parts that are going to show through. For the rolled roofing, cutting a scale three foot wide strip of black construction paper. And then on your, uh, your roof surface, you put the lines of scale two feet apart. And that way, each, uh, each one, each piece overlaps the one before by, by about a scale foot. Put the roofing paper on. I'm just going to use some diluted white glue. Dilute it just enough to make it so you can um, brush it on. Put that right on there. I want a little bit of extra overhang on this bottom piece because that's going to go over these uh, rafter tails hanging out. You don't want to cut it. You want to you want to tear it. So you get that natural torn edge. Also, you can take some of the, the strips and crumple them up like that. Give them some wrinkles and tears. Push that down in there like that. Take one of those little torn off pieces like this. Stick it right there. For this last piece along the top edge, you want to leave a little uh, little reveal up at the top, and this will get folded up against the uh, back of the false front there. And for this uh, bottom piece, which overlaps, I'm just going to put some glue on it and fold it underneath. These little flaps here will get uh, bent down over the sides of these rafter tails. Putting glue on the back of the roof rather than on the rafters so that with those rafters that show through, you won't see glue on them. Tuck that in. And we'll put some weight on that until it dries up. I'm going to show you a quick and dirty way to make a, uh, a smoke jack. Uh, I've got a piece of straw. This is from a juice box. And a piece of uh, a round toothpick. I'm going to coat this round toothpick with some, uh, some thick CA. And just put it in here. I don't want it to go all the way to the top because I don't want it to be visible. And then uh, we'll kick that CA and strengthen the joint with some uh, baking soda. Okay. Now this gets painted flat black. I've already poked a hole in the roof right there. So get some black paint on this and I'll show you the rest. Now I went ahead and also created some... Uh, flashing for the smoke jack out of some bristol board painted that black but not just black i um actually kind of painted them black and then i went over both of them with some uh, red oxide you can see on the smoke jack there just to give it a look of rust this is a ghost town after all so these uh the rust would have overcome the uh soot after a period of time. Let's again put some thick CA on here. There we go. The nice thing about the toothpick in there, it makes it easy to adjust the angle. Now I want to put the finishing touches on the trim. Uh, the top of these little uh, this little stepped roof gets some uh, some two by sixes, which I've already cut, and I'll be painting those the same green. But the top of this arch also gets a cap. 
that needs to curve over this. And the best material really to do that uh, it would be either styrene or um, some sort of paper. And um, what I've got right here is some Bristol board, which is one of my favorite go-to modeling materials. And I've cut a strip of that. And now I'm just measuring right to there. Cut that off. I cut out a little notch for the, uh, the number plate or whatever it's called up there. Let's see how that fits. Awesome. All right. Let's get some paint on that. Now, while the paint uh, dries on those other pieces, I'm going to do a little more work on this side of the building because it's going to be um, highly visible uh, where it is uh, on the Gruesome Gulch layout. I've already taken my hobby knife and gone through and kind of cut out some of these boards and broken them more a little bit. Pushed them back in, give it a little more old banded look. Now I want to do some more work on this freight door. Add uh, a piece of chain, basically holding it closed. A couple little holes. I'm going to use um, some rail spikes. Now I've got some scale chain that I've uh, painted a rusty red. Just kind of wrap that around and let that hang down. Yeah. There we go. Well, now I've got a sign that I want to put above the top of this, the door here. Um, actually, I want it to look like the sign had been up there and it uh, fell partially down. So, to create that look, I've cut a little piece of paper about the same size as the sign. I'm going to put this on here. I'll spread just a little bit of Super 77 on the back. You can see it's not perfectly cut out, but that's all right for this, uh, for this use. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some ghost weathering around the outside, pardon the pun, to make it look like uh, the sign had been there for a long time and then fell down. And the way we do that is we mask that off with something the same shape and size as the sign. And then we take some chalk. I suppose you could do this with an airbrush, too, if you were feeling really ambitious. Just a kind of gray color. Grimy, dirty gray. Take some white, some black, and some brown. Yeah, that's good. And then we just go over the top. Of course, you want to carry it down so it's not just around the sign. You want to blend it in with the rest of the wall a little bit. Otherwise, it will look odd. I'll spray a little fix on that real quick. Now we can peel this mask off and reveal where the sign used to be, just like that. For the sign itself, just got something I uh, created in Photoshop, printed out, and I'll hold that on with a couple of small dabs of glue. It look as if it just kind of fell off. It says deliveries. Drop dead here. Now I'm just using my uh, my watercolors, the usual mix of burnt sienna and cobalt blue to make a a gray that can be warm or cool depending on how you mix it. I'm using that to. Pick out a few individual boards here and add some uh, weathering in the form of 
maybe water stains that run down the side like that. You could just take your finger and smear that right down, blend it in. Also take uh, there's all those nail holes you put in and just take some pure burnt sienna and hit those and kind of streak it down. So you've got some rust coming down from those nails. That's getting to the look that I want there. Old, abandoned, and spooky. For fresh rust on this chain, I like to use a little chalk, just some full strength orange. Okay. Now I can start putting these last pieces of trim on. Starting with these uh, uh, two by six caps that go up here. Gives that a nice finished look. Now, the final piece, top of the arch. I'm going to start up here in the middle. Kind of gives me a place to key it in. Alright, I'm just going to have to clamp that with my fingers for a minute or two until the glue sets up. Not quite done with this false front yet. Two more little pieces to add. And these are uh, just some supports. Some uh, diagonal supports behind the false front here, down to the roof. One uh, little detail I almost forgot is the doorknobs. These are just some Pico track nails. I'm painting the heads of them brass to match the rest of the, uh, the plate there on the door. Now these front columns have some really nice detail it's carved in there. So I bring that out by dry brushing on some unbleached titanium give them a little weathering too now i'm once again using my my watercolor mixture just to add a little bit more weathering a little bit more age and character and some streaks down the front there where water has run down in the rain Smeared the lettering a little bit. The last thing I think I'm going to do with paint is take some very thick uh, black acrylic and add uh, roofing tar around the seams and the edges of this rolled roofing. Around the flashing where the smoke jack is. The best way I found to do this is you kind of wiggle the brush as you go because it shouldn't be perfect straight lines. It should be kind of wiggly. Now I think just a little bit more weathering with chalks and uh, call this one done. Ready for the gulch. All right. Final, final details. Got a raven here. Uh, this is from uh, Mini Prints. We've got some fantastic stuff over at Mini Prints if you haven't checked them out yet. Miniprints.com. And uh, one other detail. I've got a Pine box casket here from Crescent Creek Models. All right. That was fun. <laughs> well, let's see what it looks like over in its uh, final resting place on the Gruesome Gulch layout.
things are moving right along here on the Gruesome Gulch Project. I want to thank you all for watching that entire build video. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoy seeing this kind of thing. You can also follow Thunder Mesa over on Instagram at thunder.mesa or find out what's new on the Thunder Mesa Studio website at thundermesa.studio. And if you really like what we're doing here on the channel and would like to show your support, you can do what these nice folks did and head on over to patreon.com slash thundermesa and show your support there. Until next time, keep moving forward, my friends. Adios for now.